the seminar. We have the Honor Diagnostic Club. We would like to question you all. Welcome to all of you. And we appreciate taking time of your busy schedules. Join us today. We hope you will learn a lot today as we are lined up for you, hopefully engaging. So to begin this program, we have pleasure to have Dr. Jairam to be here. I will request Dr. Jairam to give the opening remarks, sir. Internationally, this week, starting from today till next uh, till 27, is declared as a lab professional week. But uh, personally, do you think that uh, we have to recognize laboratory professionals only during this week? It's like a traffic safety week. During safety week, only you should uh, have safe practice, and at other times, you can jump to them. It isn't so. Every day is a lab professional day. Every week is a week professional week. Every year is a lab professional. So that's where I think mutually we need to understand the strengths of each other, respect each other's commitment to what their goals they have set for themselves, and work alongside each other towards achieving that goal. I'm glad we have a, a number of people who have come from within Bangalore, peripheral as parts of Bangalore, and uh, I think there are two people who are coming from overseas, from Iran. And so we welcome you all with open arms and uh, hope you will have an uh, fruitful day of deliberations today. The topics that we have selected are a blend. We have not focused only on biochemistry or histopathology. In fact, we have avoided all those things and made general topics which would benefit each and every one of us. You all agree that coming from different uh, backgrounds, different organizations, we see having different core principles, different ways of uh, uh, working and so on. But I'm sure you all agree that each one of us, even though we come from different environments, welcome. Each one of us, though we come from different environments, have one thing in common. We are all working for the benefit of our patients. I think that common goal, that common drive brings us together and we should work hand in hand to achieve that and make India or the world a healthier place to live. And we have a very crucial role to play. Every lab, no matter how large it is, no matter how sophisticated the equipment are, the key to a success of a lab, key to the success of its mission is the people. And that is where we as lab professionals play a very, very important role. And of course, being human beings, there is always a higher chance of error. And that is where we need to be more careful, we need to be more committed, and we need to ensure that whatever we give out to our patients is the best. So with these words, I welcome you all. And uh, this, before handing over the, uh, the mic to Khan and uh, Ravi to go on with the proceedings, I'll make a small announcement about two, a few programs which we have started, training programs we have started for laboratory professionals. There are separate programs for pathologists, biochemists, which I've not included here. These are for the technologists. One is a one-year postgraduate certificate course in laboratory medicine. I think these handouts are there in your bag. You can just go through them. 
and the other is a more focused training on histopathology as well as other aspects of diabetic medicine. You can go through them if you're interested. Uh, we'll be very glad to accommodate you all. And uh, with this, I hand over the mic to Dan. Any issues you have, please be comfortable. Any issues you have, any discomfort, please come to us right away. We will sort out this. Thank you very much. Hello. Uh, I thank Dr. N. Jayong. So he has uh, made very clear that every day is a lab professional day. But probably for the sake of celebration, we are just celebrating only for one week or two days when we all assemble and we share our knowledge. So there are a few safety measures which I'm going to announce now. One is uh, uh, main thing is, I, as you know, that we are all feeling as if we are now in a classroom. So you know very well that most of the places, classrooms, mobiles are not allowed. So please keep all your mobiles in silent mode. So that's our first requirement. So everybody should feel that they are in a classroom. Because you have come here to learn something, so please make your phones in silent mode. Because in our day-to-day -day life, definitely uh, we'll be very busy with our job. So you may get calls also. So today, at least, you can dedicate your attention to this program, which will help you for the future. And the second very important thing is, in case if the fire alarm goes on, so probably we'll guide you uh, where to exit. So Anand Lab uh, employees are here, so we'll guide you. And even uh, the toilets, everything are situated very nearby. So whoever, is, whoever wants to go, so probably we can guide you for that also. So if somebody is not feeling well, please bring into our notice because we have a team of doctors who can take care of your health also. So, so uh, now actually we are starting with the program. So main is actually you know very well phlebotomy plays a very important role. So in most of the labs, I think you know very well, patients who are coming for the phlebotomy, they are not they definitely go with the pain. So definitely this pain can be converted as a pleasure. So our team of doctors, Dr. Pradeep and his team, so they will uh, they will actually give some of the tips because it's more of a skill area because many people would have been completed uh, DMLT, many people would have been doing the job of lobotomy, but probably most of the times, the comfort what they are going to give to the patients, it varies from person to person. So this phlebotomy, it can be a part of pain or it can be a part of pleasure. And if the job is done in a right way, because I feel everybody, we are in the lab industry, we know very well, if a good phlebotomy work is done, so it is taking care of both job of a technical job, because you are giving a right sample. And the patient who is, because most of the times, nowadays we see, patients are very much annoyed, they keep shouting on the front office people. So if the phlebotomy job is done well, so that can be converted as a pleasure. So I request Dr. Pradeep to take over. That's where we have a maximum interaction with the client, right? 
So whoever walks in, they have the maximum interaction with the last person that's with the plug bottom. So more better you make that first place, it means it's it's bound that they would come to you more often because of the confidence or the trust they would have on us. So did you want this? I will call up my colleague, Mr. Vijay, to take over from here. So he'll be explaining regarding the phlebotomy and I'll be taking over for the acquisition part. Good morning to everyone. My name is Vijay Kumar. I am the phlebotomist in Anand Diagnostic Center, working in two years. This is sample collection. Sorry. Telugu Kannada Baranda. Atta Sorry. No, you are comfortable? You can communicate with Canada? Sorry, we have a few people in Canada. Okay, fine. Okay. It might have to translate. A sample collection. Sample collection, Madhavikina Munchene, Avay Madhavu. Patient now, in the Okta Renana, now I am the Madhavu. Reception. First to reception Okta. Reception will be. Patient prescription and you will do other registration by registration or number sample collection area get collected. Sample collection area get patient bandanantara. Once patients will come inside our sample collection area, how we should take care about their health? Patient will come inside. Patient, we should have to greet. A smiley face to patient. Good morning, sir. Or else, patient is required for sponsoring test or whatever it is in their prescription and bill copy. Both we should have to check. After that, practice of drawing blood from patient and taking the blood specimen to the laboratory to prepare for testing. Now, we will blood sample na collect material. Here we collect material. Practice. Perfect tagi practice agar beko. Ino leh andre. Now mara dina perfect tagi marta jo ingra anta check mara dake. Kamera mata ni. Please check for any blood test that is performed in laboratory. Idu nambi key point. First of all, now we ni perfect tagi mara dale. First step inda. Second step. Sampel kalk mara dale ala. Now sampel ni yau department ke particular kalk beko. Anu dina pada na awu follow up mara beko. Patient bandha kena. Patient hope our patient care मार देखो and again our putter sample ना करना आ जाए and take care आगे department के particular आगे send मार देखो ये तो नमली रो auto tube preparation patient patient बंद मेरे ना वो prescription bill ये ला check मार देने मेरे ना मैं ले इस नली ना वो और अंदर वो bill काफी ना रखा है मारी अगर अली particular test के biochemistry test के SST tube ना select मार देखो, fluoride tube ना select मार देखो, नीरी tube tube ना select मार देखो, उनसे एक बटो, नमकी system ना ले तोड़ देते, नमा लीरो system है। आता है वो वाला, ना वो ना तो ये बिल तो एक मारी, आ test में ना ना वो first of all note कर लो, आ test के वो वाला particular चीज़ जो, अगर किरो बात कर रहे ना ना वो system में ले, ये mission के advice मार दी। आधा सेलेक्ट मार्क कोड एड्रेस मार्क मैंने मिशन अली आटोमेटिक आगे बार कोड लेबल आगे परत करना बंद मैंने सो हियर एक्चुअली वंस द क्लाइंट एंटर्स द फ्लेवोटोमी एरिया लेट्स से देयर इज अ इनएक्सपीरियंस पर्सन ओके सो इन दैट केस ही माइट बी कंफ्यूज्ड टिल व्हाट वैल्यू दे हैड टू गिव सो दैट स्टेप इज सॉर्टेड आउट इन आवर लैब बाय ऑटोमेटेड प्रोसेस वेयर we speed the barcode onto the LIS, and once it's swiped, this machine will take the data that these are the tests registered for, and it will sort like exactly what it they have asked for a CBC, it will just give a PDTA. If at all they have asked for any coagulation tests, then it will give both the citrate and the EDTA. And if FBS or something like that, it will give the tubes according. So the automated sorter is here and that will take over for the rest of it. 
ನಾವು ಸ್ನಾನ ಅವಶ್ಯ ಮಾಡಿದಾದ್ಮೇಲೆ ಹೊಸ ಸರ್ ಕ್ರಾಸ್ ಚೆಕ್ ಮಾಡಬೇಕು ಫಿಲ್ಲಲ್ಲಿ ಇರೋ ನೇಮು ಅದರಲ್ಲಿ ರಿಜಿಸ್ಟ್ರೇಷನ್ ಮಾಡಿರೋ ನಂಬರ್ ಅದನ್ನು ಚೆಕ್ ಮಾಡಬೇಕು ಆಮೇಲೆ ನಾವು ಸೇವೆಗೆ ಇಶ್ಯೂ ಮಾಡಿರೋ ಬ್ಯಾಂಕ್ಗಳು ಕೂಡ ಕರೆಕ್ಟ್ ಆಗಿದೆಯಾ ಇಲ್ವಾ ಯಾಕಂದರೆ ನಮ್ಮಲ್ಲಿ ರ್ಯಾಂಡಮ್ ಸ್ಟೇಟ್ನಲ್ಲಿ ಒಂದು ಬ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಕೋಡ್ ಇರುತ್ತೆ ಫಾಸ್ಟಿಂಗ್ನಲ್ಲಿ ಟೂ ಬ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಕೋಡ್ಸ್ ಡಿಕ್ವಾರ್ಡ್ ಆಗುತ್ತೆ ಆ ಥರ ಗೊತ್ತಿರೋ ಸೀನಿಯರ್ ಟೆಕ್ನಿಷಿಯನ್ಗೆ ಪೇಷಂಟ್ ಹೋದ್ಮೇಲೆ ಇದು ಎರಡನ್ನೂ ಕ್ರಾಸ್ ಚೆಕಿಂಗ್ ಮಾಡ್ಕೋಬೇಕು ಈಗ ಟ್ರೈನಿ ಆದರೆ ಅದರಲ್ಲಿ ಏನು ಬ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಕೋಡ್ಸ್ ಇದೆಯೋ ಅವ್ರಿಗೆ ಇಶ್ಯೂ ಮಾಡೋದು ಮಾತ್ರ ಗೊತ್ತಾಗುತ್ತೆ ಅದನ್ನು ಕ್ರಾಸ್ ಚೆಕ್ ಮಾಡಬೇಕಾಗಿರೋದು ಸೀನಿಯರ್ ಟೆಕ್ನಿಷಿಯನ್ ಮಾಡಿ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಹಾಗೆ ಪೇಷಂಟ್ ಹತ್ರ ಕೂಡ ಕ್ರಾಸ್ ಚೆಕ್ ಮಾಡಿಸ್ಬೇಕು ಪೇಷಂಟ್ ನೇಮ್ ಕರೆಕ್ಟ್ ಆಗಿದೆಯಾ ಏಜ್ ಕರೆಕ್ಟ್ ಆಗಿದೆಯಾ ಅವ್ರಿಗೆ ರಿಜಿಸ್ಟ್ರೇಷನ್ ಮಾಡಿರೋ ನಂಬರ್ ಕರೆಕ್ಟ್ ಆಗಿದೆಯಾ ಅವ್ರ ಹತ್ರ ಪೇಷಂಟ್ ಹತ್ರ ಕನ್ಫರ್ಮೇಷನ್ ಮಾಡಿಕೊಂಡು ನಾವು ಪ್ರಿಪೇರ್ ಡ್ರಾಯಿಂಗ್ಗೆ ಆ ಸ್ಯಾಂಪಲ್ ಆ ಪೇಷಂಟ್ ತೆಗಿತಾ ಇದ್ದೀವಿ ಅಂತ ಪೇಷಂಟ್ಗೆ ನಾವೇನು ಮಾಡಬೇಕು ನಂಬಿಕೆ ಕೊಡಬೇಕು ನಮ್ಮ ಸ್ಯಾಂಪಲೇ ಅವರು ಡ್ರಾ ಮಾಡ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದಾರೆ ಅಂತ ಹೇಳಿಬಿಟ್ಟು ಇದು ನಮ್ಮಲ್ಲಿರುವ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ಕೌಂಟರ್ ಸೆಕೆಂಡ್ ಕೌಂಟರ್ಗಿಂತ ಮುಂಚೆನೆ ನಾವು ಸೇಫ್ ಇಶ್ಯೂ ಮಾಡೋ ಕೌಂಟರ್ ಅವಾಗಲೇ ತೋರಿಸಿದ್ವಿ ಅದಾದ್ಮೇಲೆ ಕೌಂಟರ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ಸೆಕೆಂಡ್ ಕೌಂಟರ್ ಥರ್ಡ್ ಫೋರ್ ಫಿಫ್ತ್ ಫೈವ್ ಕೌಂಟರ್ಸ್ ಇದೆ ನಮ್ಮಲ್ಲಿ ಫೈವ್ ಕೌಂಟರ್ಸ್ನಲ್ಲಿ ನೆಕ್ಸ್ಟ್ ಸ್ಯಾಂಪಲ್ ಸೆಂಡಿಂಗ್ ಏರಿಯಾ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ನಿಮಾಟಿಕ್ ಶೂಟರ್ ಸ್ಯಾಂಪಲ್ ಸೆಂಡ್ ಮಾಡಿದೆ ಪರ್ಟಿಕ್ಯುಲರ್ ಡಿಪಾರ್ಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ಗೆ ಇದರಲ್ಲಿ ನಾವು ಸ್ಯಾಂಪಲ್ ಸೆಂಡ್ ಮಾಡ್ತೀವಿ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ಕೌಂಟರ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ಸ್ಯಾಂಪಲ್ ಸೆಂಡಿಂಗ್ ಏರಿಯಾ ಸ್ಯಾಂಪಲ್ ಕರೆಕ್ಟ್ ಆದಮೇಲೆ ಅದನ್ನು ಮಾಡಬೇಕು ಅಂಡ್ ಅದು ವಾಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಅ ನಾಲೆಜಬಲ್ ಪಾಯಿಂಟ್ ಇನ್ ಅವರ್ ಲೆಬಾರ್ಟ್ ಅವೇರ್ನೆಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಫ್ರೀ ರಿಕ್ವೆಸ್ಟ್ ಐಟಿ ಅಂದರೆ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಆಲ್ ಪೇಷಂಟ್ಗೆ ಏನು ರಿಕ್ವೈರ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಇದೆಯೋ ಅದನ್ನು ನಾವು ಮುಂಚೆನೆ ಪೇಷಂಟ್ ಹೋಗೋದಕ್ಕಿಂತ ಮುಂಚೆನೆ ನಾವು ಅದನ್ನು ಫುಲ್ಫಿಲ್ ಮಾಡಬೇಕು ಪೇಷಂಟ್ಗೆ ಇಲ್ಲ ಪೇಷಂಟ್ ಹೋದ್ಮೇಲೆ ಅದು ಪ್ರಿಸ್ಕ್ರಿಪ್ಷನಲ್ಲಿ ಬೇರೆ ಟೆಸ್ಟ್ ಇದೆ ರಿಜಿಸ್ಟ್ರೇಷನಲ್ಲಿ ಬೇರೆ ಟೆಸ್ಟ್ ಇದೆ ನಮಗೆ ಬೇರೆ ಸ್ಯಾಂಪಲ್ ಬೇಕು ಅಂತ ಹೇಳಿಬಿಟ್ಟು ನಮ್ಮ ಪೇಷಂಟ್ನ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ ಕರೆಯೋಕ್ಕಾಗಲ್ಲ ಅದಕ್ಕೆ ನಾವೇನು ಮಾಡಬೇಕು ಮುಂಚೆನೆ ಅದನ್ನು ಹೋಗೋದಕ್ಕೆ ಮುಂಚೆನೆ ಪ್ರೀ ರಿಕ್ವೆಸ್ಟ್ ಮಾಡಬೇಕು ಟೆಸ್ಟ್ ರಿಕ್ವೆಸ್ಟ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಪ್ರಿಪರೇಷನ್ ರಿಕ್ವೈರ್ಡ್ ಫಾರ್ ಸ್ಯಾಂಪಲ್ ಕಲೆಕ್ಟೆಡ್ ಟೆಸ್ಟ್ಗೆ ಏನು ರಿಕ್ವೆಸ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ಸ್ಯಾಂಪಲ್ ಇದೆಯೋ ಎಷ್ಟು ಸ್ಯಾಂಪಲ್ ರಿಕ್ವೆಸ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ಇದೆಯೋ ಅಷ್ಟೇ ನಾವು ಕಲೆಕ್ಟ್ ಮಾಡಬೇಕು ಅದೇ ಪರ್ಟಿಕ್ಯುಲರ್ ಸೀಡ್ನ ನಾವು ಸೆಲೆಕ್ಟ್ ಮಾಡಬೇಕು ಅಂಡ್ ಅದು ಆರ್ಡರ್ ಆಫ್ ಕ್ರಾಸ್ ಸೊ ಲೆಟ್ ಸೇ ಲೈಕ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಅ ಪ್ರಿಸ್ಕ್ರಿಪ್ಷನ್ ಫಾರ್ ವಿಟಮಿನ್ ಬಿ ಪ್ಲಸ್ ಆರ್ ಇವನ್ ಲಿಪಿಡ್ ಫಾರ್ ಫೈವ್ ಸೊ ವಿಚ್ ಸ್ಯಾಂಪಲ್ ವುಡ್ ಯು ಪ್ರಿಫರ್ ರ್ಯಾಂಡಮ್ ಆರ್ ಅ ಫಾಸ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ಸ್ಯಾಂಪಲ್ ಸೊ ದೀಸ್ ಪ್ರೀ ರಿಕ್ವೆಸ್ಟ್ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಟು ಬಿ ಮೈ ಇನ್ ದಟ್ ಪ್ಲೇಸ್ ಸೊ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಮಲ್ಟಿಪಲ್ ಟೆಸ್ಟ್ ವಿಚ್ ಆರ್ ದೇರ್ ಸೊ ಲೆಟ್ ಸೇ ಫ್ಯೂ ಆಫ್ ದೆಮ್ ಲೀ ಫಾಸ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ಸೊ ದೋಸ್ ಆರ್ ದ ಪ್ರೀ ರಿಕ್ವೆಸ್ಟ್ ದಟ್ ಯು ಶುಡ್ ಮೇಕ್ ಶೋರ್ ದಟ್ ಕ್ಲೈಂಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಫುಲ್ಫಿಲಿಂಗ್ ಅಟ್ ದಟ್ ಪರ್ಟಿಕ್ಯುಲರ್ ಟೈಮ್ ಸೊ ಫಾರ್ ಫ್ಯೂ ಥಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಇಫ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಅ ರ್ಯಾಂಡಮ್ ಸ್ಯಾಂಪಲ್ ದಟ್ ಇಸ್ ರಿಕ್ವೈರ್ಡ್ ಯಸ್ ವೆಲ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಗುಡ್ ಬಟ್ ವಿ ಶುಡ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಮೇಕ್ ಶೋರ್ ದಟ್ ಇಸ್ ದೇರ್ ಎನಿ ಅದರ್ ಪ್ರೀ ರಿಕ್ವೆಸ್ಟ್ ವಿಚ್ ಇಸ್ ವಿಚ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಟು ಬಿ ಫುಲ್ಫಿಲ್ ಓಕೆ ನೆಕ್ಸ್ಟ್ ನಾವು ಟೆಕ್ ವಿತ್ ಟೆಸ್ಟ್ ರಿಕ್ವೆಸ್ಟೆಡ್ ಆದಮೇಲೆ ಆರ್ಡರ್ ಆಫ್ ಡ್ರಾನ ಫಾಲೋ ಮಾಡಬೇಕು ಕ್ಯೂಸ್ ನಾವು ಹೇಗೆ ಡ್ರಾ ಮಾಡಬೇಕು
ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಆಲ್ ಬ್ಲೈಂಡ್ ಆಗಿ ನಾವು ಮೇಲಲ್ಲಿ ಬೇನ್ ಇರುತ್ತೆ ಇಲ್ಲ ಸೈಡ್ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಬೇನ್ ಇರುತ್ತೆ ಅಂತ ಸುಮ್ಮನೆ ಪಾಸ್ ಬೆಟ್ ಮಾಡ್ಬಿಟ್ಟು ಪ್ರೆಸ್ ಮಾಡೋದಕ್ಕೆ ಇಲ್ಲ ನಾವು ಏನ್ ಮಾಡ್ಬೇಕು ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಆಲ್ ಒಂದು ಬೆಸ್ಟ್ ವೇ ಅನ್ನ ಚೂಸ್ ಮಾಡ್ಕೋಬೇಕು ನಮ್ಗೆ ಮೀಡಿಯಂ ಟು ಬೆಟರ್ ವೇ ಪರ್ಟಿಕ್ಯುಲರ್ ವೇ ಅಂಡ್ ಸಸಾರಿಕೆ ತ್ರೀ ವೇ ಅಂತ ಇರುತ್ತೆ ಅದು ಎಲ್ಲಿ ಸಿಚುವೇಟ್ ಆಗಿರುತ್ತೆ ಅಂತ ನಾವು ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಫೀಲ್ ಮಾಡ್ಬೇಕು ಆ ಏರಿಯಾದಲ್ಲಿ ಫೀಲ್ ಮಾಡ್ಬೇಕು ಫೀಲ್ ಆಗಿಲ್ಲ ಅಂದ್ರೆ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಆಲ್ ನಮಗೆ ಒಂದು ಹಂಗೆ ನಮಗೆ ಫೀಲ್ ಆಗಿಲ್ಲ ಅಂದ್ರೆ ಇನ್ನೊಂದು ಟೆಕ್ನಿಷಿಯನ್ ಆಲ್ಟರ್ನೇಟ್ ಆಗಿ ಕರೀಬೇಕು ಯಾಕಂದ್ರೆ ನಾವು ಒನ್ಸ್ ಪ್ರಿಕ್ ಮಾಡಿದ ಮೇಲೆ ಪೇನ್ ಸಿಕ್ಕಿಲ್ಲ ಅಂದ್ರೆ ಕಷ್ಟ ಆಗುತ್ತೆ ಆವಾಗ ನಾವು ವೇನ್ ಚೂಸ್ ಮಾಡಕ್ ಆಗೋದಿಲ್ಲ ಅದಕ್ಕೆ ಮುಂಚೆ ಏನ್ ಮಾಡ್ಬೇಕಂದ್ರೆ ಚಾಯ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ವೇನ್ ಇಸ್ ವೆರಿ ಇಂಪಾರ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ಬಿಫೋರ್ ಡ್ರಾಯಿಂಗ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಅಗೇನ್ ಟೆಕ್ನಿಕ್ ಟು ಬಿ ಚೂಸನ್ ಓಪನ್ ಸಿರೆಂಜ್ ಆರ್ ಕ್ಲೋಸ್ ವ್ಯಾಕ್ಟೈನರ್ ಸಿರೆಂಜ್ ನಲ್ಲಿ ಡ್ರಾ ಮಾಡೋದಕ್ಕೆ ವ್ಯಾಕ್ಟೈನರ್ ನಲ್ಲಿ ಡ್ರಾ ಮಾಡೋದಕ್ಕೆ ಡಿಫ್ರೆನ್ಸಿಯೇಷನ್ ಏನು ನಮ್ಗೆ ಈಗ ವ್ಯಾಕ್ಟೈನರ್ ನ ಯಾಕೆ ಯೂಸ್ ಮಾಡ್ತೀವಿ ಸಿರೆಂಜ್ ನ ಯಾಕೆ ಯೂಸ್ ಮಾಡ್ತೀವಿ ಅಂತ ಏನಾದ್ರೂ ಡಿಫ್ರೆನ್ಸಿಯೇಷನ್ ಗೊತ್ತಿದೆಯಾ ಎನಿ ಪರ್ಟಿಕ್ಯುಲರ್ ಟೆಸ್ಟ್ ವುಡ್ ಯು ರಿಕ್ವೈರ್ ಲೈಕ್ ವುಡ್ ಯು ಪ್ರಿಫರ್ ಟ್ಯೂಬ್ ನಲ್ಲಿ ವ್ಯಾಕ್ಯೂಮ್ ಇರುತ್ತೆ ಸಿರೆಂಜ್ ನಲ್ಲಿ 
accepting. No. So they have sent a theorem sample and they want you to do a HPMC. Would you accept? No. So you should make sure that the correct sample has actually been for the test whatever they have actually discussed. So and then examining the sample adequacy. So if it's just a 0.5 ml of PDTA, would you accept? Depends on which test. If they have asked only for a PS, I would still accept it, right? So it depends. And let's say if you have a product sample like in the for the chemistry itself, if they have sent point one ml, just one ml if at all, would you accept it or not? One ml in a clot activator, would you accept it or not? So that's why, like once we are registering the sample across, so all these things are to be kept in mind. And then the registration actually happens after going through each of these things. So that's where the registration happens. So everywhere we have a single system which is up operating. So now this is, there's a area called quality check area. So then what all you can observe in this? So we have a centrifuge also. So for those samples, let's say they have, have not separated, we'll make sure that at this point itself we separate them and send it across to the department. So why sample accessioning becomes a key here? Because it's a prime sorting area now. Now, if it's a single sample, that should be straight across department. So let's say they have asked for serology also and they have asked for like dengue serology they have asked for and they have asked for something in biochemistry. Now, dengue serology, if you are doing through a higher end, it's more of a batch test, right? So, let's say it has reached somewhere around 3 o'clock, your batch should be run at 3.15. Would you prefer sending it to serology now, or would you send it to chemistry and then to serology? Now, let's say, that's what, 3 o'clock the sample has reached, it has to go through either serology it has to go to or biochemistry. So if at all your dengue test is scheduled for 3.15, would you still skip that batch? Or would you tell your report and then you send it across? Yeah. So if at all it's a batch test, so next batch will go almost the next day. So make sure that the people who are in accessioning, who are sorting across or sharing across the sample, they should be aware where it has to reach first. Taking in mind the time of the trip, okay? So let's say even for a EDTA which has come for HbA1c and hemoglobin electrophoresis or platelet count. So then, what, which would you prefer to go first? If it's a HbA1c and a platelet count? Platelet count. Platelet count. So because that becomes more critical if in that case. So then, so that's where the knowledge of the person who's sitting there to sort these samples becomes a key. So they should be aware which, so where it has, where the sample has to reach first. And then, so same thing. So sorting has to be done, keeping in mind whether it's a critical sample. So you have, let's say, you have received 50 samples in that batch. And there is one CSF which is sitting and rest all 49 are for routine chemistry. Now would you prefer to send the 49 first or the CSF first? CSF. CSF. Because the cells might get degenerated and definitely the patient might be in wait for that particular report or even the doctor for that matter. So that's the same thing. So accession as such if you take in a bigger laboratory, it's a gateway between like inside the lab where they have to share across a single sample through different departments and even if a test which is not done in a laboratory where you are outsourcing it. So the accession becomes key there also. So we have three tests which are done here and one test which is done in an outside lab. So accession will be the key area where they sort out which sample to reach where and how it should be sorted. 
So even let's say that's what for a uh, last week this happened where they have asked for a direct wound test and they have sent a serum sample. Is it acceptable? No. So like that's when when and it's reaching from a hospital which is in Tumku. So it has reached your accession and they at the quality check they say no for direct wound test is only the EDTA which is required. So they become the key when you are communicating to the people who are outside also. So, and even for that matter, that's what, let's say even I have run for, for ADTA, I have done a DCT and it's positive. So then I have to speak to the clinician because I have to alert him that it is direct from stress positive and he has to give further treatment. So even then, these are, this is the area where we actually get the complete information. So accession and phlebotomy as such, they are the first place where your sample start their journey. So they should hold the complete key. They hold the complete key literally to if you have to be a quality team throughout. So that's where we conclude. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting talk and very interesting, very interactive. Thank you, Vijay and uh, Pradeep. The purpose of uh, opening our uh, CMP with these two topics is uh, we have one uh, intention here and, uh, in our mind. Most of us, whether we like it or not, tend to consider uh, phlebotomy and accession as uh, punishment only. Am I right? When new technicians come to the lab, we say first work in phlebotomy and then come to technical area. We glorify the technical area, don't we, all of us? And how many of you technologists have actually gone through phlebotomy as your uh, first posting, or uh, how many of you have actually worked in phlebotomy? Accessioning? How many of you have felt that uh, you have not been given the right kind of department to work in, that you would have preferred to work in the technical department? Tell me honestly. <laughs> I'm sure all of you would have, after two months, after three months, after six months, you'll keep looking at the technical department. When will I be posted to biochemistry? When will I be posted to hematology? If you ask me, the phlebotomy department and the accession department are probably the most difficult departments to work in because you're interacting with a variety of human beings who have different kind of reactions to the same situation. On a given day, you may have you may have done 25, 30 phlebotomies, and 15 to 20 of them might have really appreciated that you've done a wonderful job. If you do the same thing, the 21st person will say, "What is this? You're causing so much pain to me. Have you been trained? Don't you know how to do phlebotomy?" So that kind of human variations we have to deal with. So. If you ask me, these are probably the most demanding postings in the laboratory. And on the other side, if there are errors which you commit as phlebotomists or accessioning uh, technologists, there is probably no way the laboratory is able to detect those errors. And there's probably no way in which the laboratory is able to control the errors in spite of having a tremendous degree of automation. So we would, if you ask, again, if you ask me, for me, these people are the most important professionals of the lab. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Any doubt, any questions, please ask <coughs> Pradeep and Vijay, would you please to answer them? No doubts? Any more? Probably here, we need to look at the acceptance and rejection criteria for that urology test. 
based on that instrument platform and so on. But general rule is if you have a sample that is like we make, we would do a high speed centrifugation and try to obtain a clear supernatant uh, serum and then try to do the assay. Or uh, I don't think it's worthwhile actually uh, using some agents which could clarify the serum. So the only way we try to clarify the serum is to centrifuge at high speed multiple times and see if we can get an, a fairly optically clear uh, serum, depending on the patient again. If it's a child or a, a very uh, young infant, we can't expect the child to be fasting and then give you a, a fasting sample. So depending on that, we will have to do the assay and probably add a note that the sample is compromised for its life. Sorry, I cannot understand uh, Sanat, yeah, yeah. but what I could understand, whatever he has taught, was regarding the use, the normal via collection and everything. But he didn't mention, I would like to know if there are any particular protocols in your lab for culture of this blood culture, I mean, collection of blood culture. Like in the ward, if it's there, you have like nurses, they are self trained for it. But what about if in the OPD or in the laboratory you get it, how do you collect it? Is there any particular protocol you follow? Blood culture. Because that is some that is one area where we are facing a lot of problems and we are seeing contamination, all that is. What do you follow? How do you go about it? So uh, let's see. So this there is the area which you select for. You have to stain it with your beta day. Make sure it's completely sterile and then you go ahead with it. No. Usually. <laughs> That's the usual, what everybody will do. Is there any particular procedure you are following as per the international norm? Is there any particular? Step or drop step. Step or drop step. Or drop first thing comes to the second. Yeah, in the order of draw, that would be the first uh, you collect. And we use, of course, we use uh, two uh, different disinfectants, the iodine-based and the alcohol-based disinfectants and ensure that the area is clean and take special precautions not to you know, touch the areas and all. Exactly, why I particularly ask this question when we deal with them, whenever we train them, the one big mistake, any particular bottom is draw, like what they do, despite the fact they clean the area, they'll have yeah. tonic, everything, again they'll palpate the yeah. thing. That's the way the, I question, that's what I want to say. That's a natural tendency which that's people perfect. have. To reconfirm that that's the vein is actually yeah. So though we tried a lot yeah. to have that the sterile things and wraps and so it didn't mm -hmm. work. It's just senseless. I thought maybe we have something different. And these are small things, you know. We don't really uh, pay attention to unless but we come up with problems. Yeah. Then when it comes to blood culture, like you know, it's a big thing. At the end of the day, you're paying so much, and what do you get? You get that epidermis and it all sticks yeah. and contaminates. So yeah, these are very specific situations and. Uh, probably outside the scope of a uh, broad-based uh, discussion which we are going to have now. And uh, are you, you from Iran? No. 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 Where are you from? Kashmir. Kashmir. Oh, okay. Yeah. You're working in Bangalore? Yes. Yeah, almost. For the same uh, I want to repeat for, uh, for blood culture. Uh, for uh, newborn babies, uh, how do you ensure correct? Because uh, things are very difficult to get for new one. How do you do the pressure? How do you collect new one? New one, baby, one, first, senior three, a procedure follow up, first, a third and added in the ointment, a hockey clean muddy, spirit hockey clean muddy, and again. Now, the air in a touch margin, a little dry out, mele, egg collect margin, or syringe, and it is a butterfly needle. I use margin. Baby and the particular folding another channel margin. Fold channel margin, first of all, green of field muddy. Amelia now field muddy. Proceed the egg margin and lay the case, particular again, first of all, field the way properly. Amelia power and add in a clean muddy. Amelia in Martin, baby, as a good dry margin. Dry mud is made in our spirit night market. Clean mud, like a clean agi vein and our proper agi adding the maraca. A color now mate a year in a touch maraca. Are they a butterfly made in now? Amelia insert mud. Is it a 
प्रॉपर वे टू कलेक्ट फंड यह बात नहीं है Actually, I would like to modify your question a little. It's a newborn baby. The veins are very easily visible. If once the baby is say two months to six months, right. newborn means uh, one day, two day, old day. Two yes, day. that is the time when the veins actually are 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 well uh, felt or well seen. We don't get that many challenges in that. But when the baby puts on weight, you know, at the two months to six months, then they become more uh, uh, wrinkly and uh, difficult to pin down. That is when the problem is. But otherwise, basic principles. There are people who use uh, uh, you know, needles, and then they let the blood drop into back to tennis with those funnels. But in our lab, so we do not get too many of those uh, walking into our uh, laboratory for collection. Whenever we have to collect samples from newborn, it is with the help of two people who actually uh, hold the baby, and then one person uh, pacifying the mother. The phlebotomist would use a, a butter pen with, of course, a tip. Thank you, Pradeep Manjha. Now, it is my pleasure to invite uh, Ishwara Ma'am, CEO of Newborn Groups, to share our knowledge about the uh, client interface. Good morning. I think we need to wake up this scene. Good morning. Thank you so much for being here. I am completely non-technical, so obviously it's going to be a little different from what Vijay and Dr. Sadeep spoke. Thank you so much for that. That was excellent. I am just going to cover the part where all the technical questions that you asked, how to do all those technical things. I think we need to keep in mind that who are we doing this for? The patient? The customer? They have no idea of the big words you use, isn't it? They have absolutely no idea. So therefore, I would like to complement what you guys presented, which is what can we do one step ahead, which is the human connect. Because a newborn baby's parents, or somebody who has all those technical things that you're talking about, will not understand what you're doing. They don't understand that you're not supposed to touch. They don't understand the tonic. They don't understand anything. So what do you think they understand? We understand the simple language of giving care. Do you all agree? So that's all I'm covering. It's a very short thing. So customer interface. I'd like to call it as customer centricity. Do you know what centricity means? Center? Correct? Center? So we have a policy in Anand Lab that whatever we do, we make sure that we are customer centric. Okay, what is customer centric? It might look, this might be the only slide on my PPT that looks a little complicated. Everything else is very, very simple. What does customer centric thinking mean? And this applies to each and everybody sitting here. Customer centric means putting the customer or patient, I do not like to call everybody a patient because what if I'm coming for a wellness check? I'm not a patient, isn't it? So I'm just calling them customer for the same reason. So customer centric means putting the customer at the center of everything that you do, or doing everything with the customer in mind. Customer-centric means thinking from the outside in. It's as simple as that. I know it's not, but we tell you about it. So who is your customer? Who is our patient? In our lab, we have two types. One is, of course, the patient and the customer itself. Two is, of course, the labs and the hospitals. And there are some doctors here with us, right? They are the doctors, the labs, the clients, the vendors, whatever you want to call them. So these are the two customers, right? So who are you in that case? What is, who is, who are all of us? We have technicians with us, we have doctors with us, we have phlebotomists with us. So who, who are we? Who are we in this entire equation? Who are we? According to me, we are nothing but the patient's partner in health. You all agree with me? That's basically what we are we are actually partnering them to get better, right? So that's where we play a role. So what I've done is I've just put in a lab, in basically our lab, you'll probably get a lab tour from all of us, the touch points for a customer. Phlebotomy, right? You've got logistics, what Dr. also explained, accessioning and logistics. Front desk, 
the health center, the call center, and of course home collection. A lot of you do home collection here? Yes? Okay. So just to give you an idea, and this will be the basis of what we're going to be discussing. We have tried to do something, and we're still in the process of doing it. We've tried to bring in something called the five cent customer appeal program. We all have five senses. What are they? Correct, no? We all have five senses, right? So that's the program that we were running where we actually appeal to the five senses of the patient or the customer. Again, not technical. This is a language that a non-technical person like me will understand with a patient, okay? So I'm just gonna give you examples of all of them. Eyes, vision. What do you think is important when a customer or a patient walks in? You think this is important? You think first impressions make a big impression? Isn't it? Doesn't that what la leaves an impression? Lasting impression? You heard all these words? So just for example, there are many labs here, many people who work in different hospitals. It's very, very important. I'm giving you just random examples. For a patient to walk in, he's already either ill or he's looking for a wellness check. The minute he walks in, don't you think your place should be neat and tidy? Imagine you walk into a phlebotomy station, like the pictures that doctors show. Imagine that place is completely cut, cluttered with cotton balls, open syringes, syringe caps, open dustbin. Do you think that's appealing? The tidy and neat and tidy center, well-groomed staff. Just imagine if the phlebotomist who's actually drawing the blood has dirty nails, or is not wearing a glove, or is not groomed, or anything. See, a lot of you are smiling. It's not good, isn't it? And cluttered, and very, very cluttered there. Sorry, that needs to be uncluttered there. So imagine your table, front office, whoever is here, whoever is listening, front office. Imagine your desk is filled with PRF, your test request forms. It's all dirty. What does that give off? My God, this seems to be a very unprofessional place, isn't it? The inamenities. You think it is fun to walk in for a urine sample and find the restroom dirty? Makes a difference, isn't it? Let's go to the next one. What about this? And this we've seen in many government hospitals. We've seen in many rushed, big, crowded OPDs. What happens? Too much noise, isn't it? And that's something that we can't do much about in India. We are too many people in India. There's not much we can do about it. But what are the small things that we can do? Try and avoid the area that you're having a conversation with a patient. I've heard this many times. Patient has come with a PRF, like this morning I've been coughing. If I'm coughing and I'm trying to explain to you what I want and you're not listening to me because it's too noisy, and you're constantly asking me, what's your name? Huh? Aishwarya, what? Huh? You think it's nice. Just make sure that at least your interactions are clear and nice. I did staff and customer. This is something that I'll touch upon again. I mean, I remember Dr. Jairam said, you know, phlebotomy and acquisitioning is so important. It is so true. You are the first people, or at least the phlebotomists, are actually the people who get the brunt of a hangry customer. Do you know what hangry is? Angry to me, no, na? Angry. What is hangry? H. Patients who are hungry, and therefore they're very angry. <laughs> Correct, no? They're fasting, yeah? Come on. They're fasting, they're coming to you for a blood collection. Of course they're going to be hangry. They want to go and eat. You've already done 30 collections. You've already drawn 30 patients' blood. The 31st patient might be hangry. That should not put you off. You need to keep the patient in mind. You need to understand why they're so upset. Why they're, they want to go and eat, be bada upset. That's why they're hangry, okay? In compassionate tone because of that. You can't tell the customer, hey, I've been doing this from 5.30 in the morning. 30 collections, please bear with me, sir. They have to bear with you, remember that. No, this is a big thing and you won't believe, you should actually see our feedback. We take a very regular feedback mechanism. It is actually shocking and it's actually very silly that there are some patients that complain of the hygiene factor of the phlebotomist. Do you all agree with me? We are all in one arm distance from the patient, isn't it? It might sound so silly, why is this lady coming here and telling us to use deodorant? But we get feedback forms where the complaint actually is unhygienic stuff. It could be you and me. Just make sure that this is very clearly taken care of. Unpleasant smell. The biggest thing, hospitals, everybody who's coming here, the biggest feedback that we got is we open at 5.30 or 6, isn't it? 
That's the business we are in. You know the first smell that the patient gets? Phenoid, mopping. See, all of you are nodding your head. It's very unpleasant. What do you do? Just open half an hour earlier. It's as simple as that. Unhygienic stuff, what I said, okay? Let's go to touch. The only thing that we are doing here with, which involves touch is of course double pricks. You inflict pain upon the patient. We all have done double pricks, I'm sure, yes? Try now, let's try and avoid that. There's nothing much that we can do for taste, but for example, in Anand lab, we've tried, we are trying to bring in this thing where when it's really hot outside, there's a bubble top, there's access to water. We don't serve coffee and tea and all that to our patients, but we at least make sure there's something, at least water is available for our patients. So you get where I'm coming from? Doesn't this have all the five things that we are talking about? You all agree with this? Yeah. Let's just go into like just small examples, and that's probably what's going to conclude my talk here. These are all the touch points that we spoke about. Let's go to the main one, phlebotomists. I think most of you here are phlebotomists. This is something that we tried doing. I think Vijay can also speak about this. This is something that we've tried doing for the last eight months and we've really, really tried it. We've made a change in it. You all believe that the feedback usually is good, bad, no, what? Good, average, excellent, right? So we've changed it. We've changed it to, what is good, bad, excellent? We've changed it to, does it meet your expectation? Does it not meet your expectation? Does it exceed your expectation? Isn't that better? Isn't that much better instead of good, bad, ugly? Have you come here, you had an expectation in mind. Even this seminar that all of you are here, did I meet your expectation is the question I should ask, not was I good or bad. The same way, we set the right expectation. We have seen that the minute the phlebotomist before doing the, you have the order of draw, all the technical things you have. But the non-technical bit, we said that there will be a process before you draw blood. For example, you will set the expectation right with you. If I'm drawing your blood, I will tell you the truth. I will set the expectation, ma'am, little bit pain will be there. Are you ready? My name is Aishwarya. I will be drawing your blood, etc., etc., etc. Tell her what she needs to be done, hold, clench the fist or whatever, all that technical things. Set her expectation right. Ma'am, you will feel a small prick. We have tried the other thing. Ma'am, you'll be perfectly fine. No pain at all. You'll feel nothing. And then you go and do double pricks. <laughs> Not fun, no? So you set the expectation right. Ma'am, my name is Ashwarya. I will take care of you. Therefore, we have a script, which is pre-blood draw script, which makes you comfortable with me. Once that is done, you again have a technical process of the tourniquet and all of that. Post which here, you are eager to go on to the next patient, isn't it? You have people waiting in line to open, they are taken. You forget about this lady who you've been very nice to. What do you do? Like, you know, oh yeah, please go out. Please make sure that is closed. This has made such a big difference. We have people coming to Anand lab asking for phlebotomists because of this relationship. And you all agree at the end of the day, it's all about people management. It's all about relationship management. So if I finish, I by mistake double pick you, could happen, apologize. Say, I'm so sorry ma'am, I didn't expect that to happen. I'm really sorry it hurt you, but you will be fine. This is what you need to do, etc, etc. Inform her what the next step is. This is something we've again noticed. We've noticed that the phlebotomist thinks the minute the blood is drawn, the job gets over there. It doesn't, right? You're in a lab, you're in a hospital. What is the next question the patient will ask you, which you don't answer? Report kab milega? Correct, no? And you're so irritated, you're so busy, you just seem to be busy, you're not really that busy, that you're saying, please ask, ask outside. Doesn't it make a difference that after I do this, you're asking me thank you, I'm again, it's very important to introduce yourself. You don't, you don't understand the power of like, Vijay, patients know him by name. It's a big thing. Why don't you tell ma'am, ma'am, I'm sorry it hurt, I'm, you'll be okay. If there's anything, please come back in touch with us, get back in touch with us. Your reports are available so and so and so time, so and so date, or you go to the front desk, somebody will be there for you. Thank you very much. I'll see you soon. Makes a difference? So just simple, small things because you all have a checklist of what to do technically. You know what has to be done technically. But trust me, if you do the non-technical thing, the experience that you're going to be giving your patient or customer is going to be Amazing, and that's pretty much why we all are here, right? So this is phlebotomy. Logistics, 
you understand what any anybody from the logistics team here? Logistics is I hate this word. People who go and pick up our samples and bring it back. That's what they used to call these boys, right? But according to me, the logistics is very, very important. Logistics is basically who? Somebody who goes to the lab, collects the blood sample, and transports it to the main lab for processing, right? So they play a huge role. Why? They are the most frequently visiting person to that lab. They are the face of your company for that lab. So it is very silly for us to ignore them. In turn, what all the doctors here, all the ones who are running labs and hospitals, I recommend you please train them, please groom them, because they will be your feedback collection managers. Your logistic person is meeting your lab or hospital or client or whatever you want to call them more than twice or thrice a day for pickups, correct? They know them better than you know them. Why don't you use them as a feedback collection manager? Why don't you train them to ask, is everything okay? Are the reports coming on time? Is there anything we can help you with? Relationship ho gaya? Agreed? Please do that. Home collection. Some of you phlebotomists do home collection, right? Yes? Any home collection phlebotomists here? People who go to people's homes? Or anyone from your organization? Anybody in your organization does home collection? Okay, yeah, perfect. So, according to me, this is even more important than the phlebotomist in the lab. Because again, expectation. You are coming into my home. You are coming into my house to draw my blood. Don't you think you need to be a little bit more precise, polite when you're there? So whatever I said there is the same thing except here, you can't walk into the house with dirty chappals. You can't walk into the house with a, with a being unhygienic. You can't walk into somebody's house and be rude, right? So here, our home collection team is specially trained how to handle this. And usually what happens in home collection, somebody comes to my house to collect blood, 90% of the time, my mother will also come, ha, mera bhi leo. Right? I want these tests also. Exactly, you know? So the person who's going to collect the blood has to be so good in actually understanding the name of the test, the sample type, and all that. So please train your home collection phlebotomist separately. Front desk. Anybody here who's a receptionist, who's the front, this thing? All right. In your place, according to me, most of the time in our center, we have a phlebotomist who is also a front desk, who also does registration, billing and all of that. This is fairly simple. This is the person that you see for the first time when you walk in, correct? And if you're going to be in a bad mood, you're not going to smile, you're going to be in a very busy mode. Does it appeal to the customer? So this is the person who makes the first impression. And in a lab like Anand's, we will take you on a lab tour. Of course, this is a, a, one of the largest labs around and therefore the population of customers are much larger. But what we find is if the receptionist does not help the customer from entry to exit, it really doesn't, it really confuses the person. Don't you agree? You came here. Don't you want to know what you're in store here? You came for this conference, right? Wouldn't you like to know what you're going to hear? Like how beautifully Ravi explained what Dr. Pradeep and Vijay are going to talk. Like what I told you what I'm going to talk. Would you like just not knowing where you're going? No, right? Same way when a patient walks in. Every lab, every hospital is different. Entry to exit is always different. It would be great if the receptionist prepares you. Sets the expectation, ma'am. Token lelo. Once you take the token, please go here. Please go here. This is the thing. Exit. Come and meet me and please leave. Makes a difference? So according to me, all the front desk needs to do is educate the patient on the flow of what is going to happen from the time he enters to the time he Then you've got your call center. I'm not sure if any of your uh, teams have this, but most of our teams, the phlebotomist itself is there in the center picking up the call. Now remember here, the five things won't work. You can't see the person. You can't smell the person, right? There's no double breaks happening. It's just on the phone. But wherever, even the technical department, we have this internally as well. The accessioning team calls biochemistry technicians communication. It's so important to remember that your tone, what you speak, clarity has to be there. The patient mustn't, mustn't feel that they're not willing to help. I called regarding one test. All I asked for is, should I do fasting or not fasting? The person was so rude to me. I said, you don't know, sir. The patient was, person was so rude to me, did not tell me the details. Patient asked, can I come at 5 o'clock for this? The call center said, we don't have any appointment system. Please walk in. 
It's just the way you say, right? So please instruct your call center, the person who picks up the phone, whoever it is, to remember that you are not going to be seen by the patient. And therefore, it is so important for your tone, for your eagerness to help to come across. You all agree with me on that? This basically covers all the touch points that we are talking about. Do you all agree? This entire session after me is going to continue to be technical, is going to continue to have SOPs, manuals, um, optimum results, procedures, and all of that. You're going to have a lot of scientific and technical knowledge sharing that's happening. I, I request you and I actually really, really hope that you keep what I said in mind, that all that you're talking about technically, the patient and customer doesn't know. All they are going to relate to is the language of care. And if that is not given to them, you might use the perfect needle, you might do the perfect technical thing, it will not matter. So with that, I leave this. I'm sure you all know this saying. The customer is the most important visitor on our premises. He's not dependent on us. We are dependent on him. He's not an interruption in our work. He is the purpose of it. He is not an outsider in our business. He is a part of it. We are not doing him a favor by serving him. He is doing us a favor by giving us an opportunity to do so. So please treat your customer or patient with a lot of care, a lot of genuine concern. And trust me, all the technical things that you're going to learn today is going to give much more better results. Thank you very much.
after this non technical session so uh, i thank aishwarya madam she has given a very simple input which can be followed by each and every lab and the difference definitely you can feel the difference so now we are having one more very important part of uh, the lab which can contribute to the end result uh, we have pre analytical error control of pre analytical error by dr pradeep and team so i request uh, dr pradeep to take over the call issue the vacuum tainers 
and then whether the prerequisites for that particular test is ordered, almost it's a repeat of the previous, but I'm just going through because it's a part of your preamble itself. And then about the order of draw, the sample adequacy and the quality check at the department. So all these steps happen before the sample reaches your analysis stage. So at this point, I have my colleague Oshan, who is a front office executive, a reception executive. So he would brief us through what all things we do in our lab, where and what his role is. Good morning. First, I thank Dr. Rajit sir for giving me such a good opportunity to explain about the registration. And in our lab, how the registration process happens is, first the client enters, is going to getting a token with the pre-registered person. He's going to give a token and he makes them to sit. When the token number falls, he's going to, for the billing counter, then he goes to the sample collection. What in pre-registration happens is, whether the person going to check whether the tests are run here, some tests going to be outsourced and some tests we are doing here, some tests we are uh, transferring to a foreign also. And those things will be confirmed and confirmed and the information is given to the client also. And the next step, three requests request, whether the patient to be in fasting, uh, whether the test requires fasting or not, and uh, how the patient pre-prepared for the test, that is more important. Registration. So in your lab, how many of you actually use computers while you're registering for a sample? Any? Instrument, instrument. How many, how many of you? Hmm? Everyone? So it's like when you are actually registering and it, you have a LIS, Laboratory Information System, the registration doesn't happen like, okay, you are putting just a CVC and the CVC goes. It's like you have particular test stored at that which gets transcribed on to the next few steps. So that's where, like, we'll find it. Yes, uh, they start the registration. Uh, in the database, they have mentioned hemoglobin, pack cell volume, total count, differential count. It all comes together in CBC. So we ask our customer, shall we take CBC? All, all will be included in CBC. Or else they will be asking CBC, ESR, blood picture. We will confirm with the client whether we can take hemogram. All will come in the hemogram itself. Uh, Next, the verification. It is one of the most important process where the error is going to be filtered in this process. Uh, later, I will explain you about this briefly. So at this point of verification, what we, so actually what used to happen was there was one step at the registration phase, and then that would carry along to the entire rest of the process. So the next step would be at even at the level of lobotomy or even at the level of doctors, when they are seeing what all tests are requested. So there might be some discrepancies about the gender, the age, and then even spelling of it. Or let's say they have, so at this point of step, like at verification, there was one uh, example which I could give, which happened just about two months ago, like where they had asked for a pro and where an inexperienced person was sitting and they just registered for calcitonin. So how often you think like, is there a difference between pro-calcitonin and calcitonin? Yes. Very much, right? So a person registered for calcitonin rather than a pro-calcitonin. Now since we had a step at verification where the most experienced person of the reception desk sits, so they were able to tell that no, we have taken a wrong test code and we can transcribe it on to the proper test code. So with this, introducing this particular step at our lab, the pre-analytical error pertaining to registration was nearly about 30 to 35%. We 
it has now dropped down to nearly 2 to 3 percent. Like if you take the things like demographics and age, gender for that matter. So those things are literally getting filtered at this stage of verification and that's where we make sure the most experienced person sits and they go through, like once it's there, they go through the TRF, see whether those are the tests that are asked for and whether they are the ones which are paid for. So we just like to show how it actually happens. So here we can actually select through the different branches, whatever we have. Even we can select whether they are the only walk-ins. That means those are the ones who are actually encountered in our particular research. So there are many drag downs and there you can actually get. So once So actually the patient list would come here and once we click on each particular individual, the prescription whatever we do, we actually scan it out. So once it's scanned, that will get carried to, through that one particular register number and the person who is verifying it will be able to see the tests which are requested, the particulars of that patient and everything. So and then they will be able to see here what are the tests that are registered? So that's where we do the verification. So coming to the phlebotomy area again. So So once the registration is done, so we had the checkpoint there. So the pre-analytic regarding the registration and the tests that are taken, little like when once I told about the procalcitonin and the calcitonin. So things like that, they are reduced. So once they reach the phlebotomy area, they are sorted with the automated sorter, which we explained earlier. So and then, now you can, how many of you actually use face barcode by yourself at your lab to the vacuum tenor or the tubes or the specimens, whatever you get? That's all automated? Or how would you say? Like, how many of you have a ha handwritten thing on the vacuum tenor still? Or would you still paste the barcode by yourself? The labels are barcoded or handwritten? It's manual pasting. Manual pasting. Okay. Is it handwritten or no? Barcoded. Bar That's good. So barcoded is one step where you can minimize that error. Let's say we are. So having a barcode, like let's say. Once the barcode is read, at, you have a different barcode scanners at each station. So there, like, it will give you the number of tests that are ordered for whether you have actually taken the, that particular person's barcode or the tube itself. So with the automated sorter, that one thing is sorted where, let's say when most of you are telling it's a manually pasted barcode. So that might still put, you might put it on a wrong thing because we we as humans we still do errors we have hundreds of things so out of hundred we still might be forced to do one error at least so then that's where your automated sorter will help us like it will once you feed the register number onto the device it will just give the particular vacuum tenders to the test so again yes barcoded labels so it would reduce errors and at our lab so once in your labs, if I have to ask, once the phlebotomy thing is happening, 
Now you have the phlebotomist and you have the client who is sitting. How, like, how would you have the verification that the person who is undergoing phlebotomy is actually putting into this his tube itself? Asking the patient to clean the bathroom. Yeah, so that's called positive identification. So you ask your client who is sitting next you so that's a me means of communication also for us to be very effective so once you have a thing like like let's say mr Pradeep, can you just see this is this, your spelling is correct and this is the you which are going to get your blood into you, he would be pleased once you address him with sir or with his name to it so that would even build the rapport between the phlebotomist and the client also so now the procedure related again when we spoke about the prerequisites passing for a B12 sample, lipid profile. So that's what once you have established that rapport between the client, he would be you would be able to tell like, okay, sir, let's say it's for a PPBS. And you can ask, did you have your breakfast, sir? What was it? Everything. So even then you should be aware of all drop drop. So with the barcode, whatever you face, you have anything additional to the number you face with the tube or how it is? The test name will be there. Sorry? The test name will be there on the barcode. Okay, that's good. So like in case, like let's say, again, you are putting an experienced person or anyone for that matter. So for order of draw, you can actually put it like, so what's the order of draw if I have a citrate hepatin EDK? Citrate first. Yeah. So for that you can actually label them as two, one, two, three itself. So let's say for culture is the first. So you make that barcode, you have that number, next to that you have number one. And then for a citrate you can put it as number two. For a hepatin you put it as number three. And for EDK, you put it as number four. So even if, because like let's say I'm a very inexperienced person now, I'm seeing the client for the first time, I might still get confused. Okay, what is it? What is it? So once I have the label with one, two, three, four, which is signifying my order of draw, that would actually solve that error. So that's one one thing that we can do in active in addition to the test name. But that's what, they should be aware that for this test, this particular sample, so you might still get confused. So, so what we in our lab have practiced is, like put the order of draw next to the resistance number itself. So and then, Tony K, we spoke about that, and mode of system, open or closed, about the vacuum and syringe we spoke of. So, about the post procedure, if we have to speak about, so there should be a thorough mixing of the samples in the bank containers. Now, how many of you actually work in a hospital based setup? Okay, so you use pneumatic tube for transport? Yes. So, so if, it, if at all we are considering it to be kind of in house, so then you have to use a pneumatic tube for scooping which are the assays which you would not prefer to transport the samples across a pneumatic tube? Yeah, so body fluids mainly we need not use. So if at all it's for a platelet function test, would it still? Preferably not, that's what they said. So then if at all, like when we spoke of accession, so the transport of vacutainers that time, it should have reached with the standard instruction. So a remote area is, which is sending across, let's say they have sent slides, just a peripheral smear slide because they don't have staying facility there. They just have one single lab or a collection center. So they are sending it us, sending it for us, the slides only. If it's broken, it cannot be evaluated, right? So but like it should reach in a prescribed standard condition. That's what so there, let's say the sample is hemolyzed, and you have to run a CBC to it. So that time, because they haven't followed the procedure of two to eight degrees, and the sample is hemolyzed, would you still accept that to examine? No. So that's why once 
you can create a database with them or a communication saying these are the instructions and this is how the sample should be. So that's one place where you can actually reduce the pre-analytical error. So once, even before it gets on to the analyzer, it reaches the central lab or whatever, right? That sorting area or the receiving area, which is just next to the machine. So there also, the as which is asked for is a platelet count and there is a plot in it. Would you prefer to examine it? No. Now there is a CSF sample, you have to share it across. There is only one ML. Okay? So, okay, let's, let's not take that. So we have two epitainers of CSF. They haven't labeled which is serial and which is not. Okay? So in that case, that's where your barcode helps. Like if they can mention in the label itself that this is sterile and you can put that 01 barcode onto that, they can actually reduce error rather than, because if at all there is a subsequent sample that is collected and from that if you are doing the calculation, you can get error based results. So I'll just uh, get to few scenarios just to wind this up with. So this is how uh, a display will come on to any of our testing person given to a person who is signed out. So we have a blood group test asked for and that's what we have. That's a Delta card method and this is your forward A, forward B, RH. So with that what you feel the blood group is. If it's on the top it is agglutinated. So what do you feel the blood group is? Hmm? Is the forward of A which is down that is negative, forward of B there is agglutination, forward of R H there is agglutination, B positive. So once you have interface, so let's say there is a manual transcription here and the person who has tested has put it as B positive, the person who is actually typing it has put it as A positive by mistake. So there itself, once you are interfacing, you can have like that's not pre but still. Uh, so what the significance of this is once we capture each and everything in our lab. So here in this person, they have asked for a CPC, we actually captured the cell counter thing. If they would have asked for a VIGA, they would have captured that whether it's positive or negative. So similarly for this capturing image. So at the pre, like this is still a pre-analytical thing. So when we have a capture at like that's what, when you told there's a plot and it's for a platelet, I can capture that so that the person who's signing out is aware that this sample is plotted and we haven't tested for it. Okay. So let me get through the scenarios. So scenario one, where your hemoglobin is 22 and the RBC count is 10 million, is it acceptable? In the test request form, it, has, it is written as for serum iron test and hemoglobin. So once the clinician has asked for iron profile, what is he looking for? Something related to iron deficiency? So in that, will you accept the hemoglobin of 22? No. So what might be the reason for this? Improper mixing with iron. Okay. So we had a very similar case from coming from a very same hospital. So there also we have something like hemoglobin of 17 and RBC is like 7.5 million. So this was the iron results of that patient. So total iron is less than two. But look at the UIBC and all. Once a and is it acceptable for a person who is expecting it to be iron deficiency. So, one more patient, like two cases which I have put, so these are the things, again. Total iron, less than two, unsaturated, iron binding capacity 118, not acceptable. So, there's a trend between these two. There's very similar thing. Hemoglobin is high, and again, your iron is showing very similar values, and it's coming from the same hospital. Then once we checked, it was the same phlebotomist who was going. Probably the delay 
in the tourniquet he mixes aspartate molasses and that's what has given the erroneous results in hemoglobin okay so that's one scenario now coming to this very good thing now this is a child who was treated for acute leukemia and they have told he is in remission that means now the disease is no more presently and he comes saturday morning and gives the sample the platelet count says 37000 and we cross check with other analyzers it says 25000 so now whenever when we are speaking of acute leukemia so always a bother about the platelet count once it drops the doctor would think that maybe he has got the disease back that's how it is so if you actually observe the visits of the same child previous 4 lakh 3 lakh 3 lakh 4 lakh suddenly 37000 now would you think that this is because of a disease that has progressed or something related to sample collection how would it be if anyone can come up with a long term how long term is there why not Okay, clot was checked for there was no clot. Clot or diluted sample. Diluted, I would have got a hemoglobin low. So what happened? This is what we saw in the screen. So then we called back the child's father. He told, I asked, how was the phlebotomy today? Was he comfortable? and he was doing the procedure when the procedure was being done to know there was actually a double thing first initially they tried and then again so and they were connecting to a syringe and this is what happens so your test results might not be solely dependent on the disease or the analysis part itself it might be something related very much to pre analysis so we spoke through the first like ipl right that that person was not supposed to give no ball for the height basis so if that person would have done this job properly i would have told it so this is still pre analytical for him the job description is to give the no ball for only the over setting right not the height so for them so that's where your pre analytical matters so if the particular thing till it reaches analysis you take care of each and every part you can control the errors completely thank you thank you wonderful especially the ipl examples <laughs> i think there are certain very clear messages that we want to convey through this uh, particular session on uh, building checkpoints in the lab one thing is there is no uniform uh, solution that we can give the checkpoint we have built has been developed over years of experience over years of being you know aware that we have committed mistakes over years of analyzing those mistakes and seeing how we can overcome them it's not mandatory that mistakes which happen in our lab happens in your lab it may be different set of uh, errors that happen one common thing is that no lab is free of error whatever we do we cannot claim that we are error free our aim is to strive to minimize these errors and the only way we can minimize errors is through building of multiple checkpoints there are some errors which we accept now registration errors gender errors no matter what we do how much training we give to the you know, front office staff there is always going to be and there are so many gender changes which we make every day our uh, technical staff put up messages saying uh, sex of patient changed from male to female so we do so many sex change surgeries in the technical departments every day so these are checkpoints which we have to build ultimately we must ensure that whatever happens within the lab the final gate through which your result goes should be error free so that should be our goal 
we built now what uh, Pradeep was talking about in barcode labeling. Barcode itself, to a great extent, reduces transcription error. And then when it comes to positive identification of patients, one simple practice which our phlebotomists have been taught to do is to show the barcode sticker to the patient or to the client, saying identify whether this is your name. Is this foolproof? I'll give you one example. We had a couple, both of whom came for uh, glycohemoglobin and uh, marking sugar. The husband is diabetic, wife is not. Now, the results which we released was the wife's glycose high, the husband's glycose normal. We didn't check the delta probably at that time. We got a feedback saying that I am a diabetic, my glycose is normal, my wife is not a diabetic, my glycose is given high. Now when you make an investigation, go backward, we asked them, was the label shown to you? They said yes. Then we say this is uh, very unlikely to be an error, so we collect their sample, repeat the test, then it came okay. But where exactly was the error? <laughs> the label, Mr. Ramakrishna, Mrs. Ramakrishna. Our phlebotomist did not pay attention to that uh, title, showed that, and uh, Ramakrishna said, yes, Ramakrishna is there, but he identified Mrs. Ramakrishna. So again, there you need to bring in a double checkpoint of uh, double identification, name, age, various things we need to bring in. So it's, it's a never-ending process, and we can never say we are free of error. And this challenge is like Tom and Jerry's story, without, without, uh, you know, the Jerry going and irritating Tom, Tom feels bored. Without errors in our lab, we are going to feel bored. We feel we, are, we have no place in the lab. So I think this is, this keeps us alive. Right? Any questions? Any questions, any doubts, please correct me. Dr. Vipi, please to answer this. Uh, actually, I don't have a doubt, but I would like to share one experience in our lab, maybe they can just enlighten on this and how do you cope with that for them? You can be enlightened. You know, you have a chat in your lab now. So like what we face in our lab, like whenever we have tests which have a like long chat, for example, we have ELISA, which we have to run tomorrow, then what usually happens, the samples with the short chat, like the samples which are to be released within three hours, they'll, like at the registration desk only, this usually happens, they'll believe in the same, this thing. And when we are releasing the uh, samples, like DDR will release now, and then uh, next day when we are releasing the ELISAs, and when we are at the end of the month calculating the test, we most of the time get that error because of the phlebotomy or the registration, despite the fact we try so much, or for the matter, two samples, like this. Uh, so, is this same problem you are also facing, or have you dealt with it? Is there anything you can do about it? Yeah, previously, all these days, we were having one particular pad for one particular digit number. But now we have split it into departments where there is a test prescribed turnaround time. That we are, we are still in the process of it. So what, so let's say that's what, a very simple thing. I have asked for the CBC and a malaria QBC. Same patient has come for blood plasma. Keep it. So that I would say, report after three days, like whatever. Like almost in the fifth, fifth day, like third day, let's say, if you have a culture sensitivity. But for a CBC and MPQBC, I need a turnaround time of just three hours, maximum four hours. But because it's not getting reflected, because your overall turnaround time for that particular number is lost. So that's what you are telling me. So that's where your IT department. So they can help you in designing a turnaround time for particular parameter research or a particular department. So particular department, only the CBC and the malaria QBC. So you prescribe that to be a four hour turnaround time. And for the rest of the thing, that goes to a different department. So that's what we did where one particular number, one particular patient was getting a broader stat, and now we are split it into a different thing. 
Yeah, essentially, I'll try to put what uh, Pratik mentioned in a different way. We have the same question, we have the same problem, where a patient who has uh, tests which are random access should have been ready within an hour, have been batched with some other investigations which are probably going to take a few days. So one solution, we, we went through this process where we thought we could have a solution by having two different registrations, as you mentioned, two different numbers, two different uh, test codes. But then are we going to collect one tube with two barcodes? Are we going to collect two tubes? So those issues cropped up. But putting two barcodes on one tube opened up another Pandora box of problems. How we are going to track which barcode we are going to track and so on. So now we unified it, made one barcode for one tube, one registration number for whatever test the patient has got. But we have brought in a mechanism where the moment a segment of the report, a departmental report or part of the reports are ready, then partial reports are available for the patient to download or the client to download. So that way it goes in compartments. The reports which are pending, taking longer time, they will be downloaded when they are ready. So if you have platelet count, glucose, and maybe dengue serology or some other serology, platelet count and uh, glucose would have been ready in an hour. They download those reports. The other report they download a day or two days. Thank you. No more questions? Okay, we'll continue. So, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Deepak and Mr. Wilson to share their knowledge of a good work, good workman takes care of his tools. Good afternoon, everyone. Care of tools. I'm Dr. Deepak. Care of tools. Do you think this is necessary? I'm sure all of you have some vehicle in your home, okay, bike or a car. So, do you wash it regularly? Do you give it for service? Why do you do? What is that called? If you don't do that, what will happen? Breakdown. So then it is a preventive maintenance. So prevention is better than cure. So preventive maintenance is very much necessary. So as uh, we are all dependent on equipments, so it is our uh, bread and butter. So we have to take care of our equipment. So Mr. Wilson is a very senior technician and uh, he has a lot of experience in uh, handling and uh, handling the equipments in Anand Lab. So today he will speak about his experience on how to maintain the equipment. <coughs> Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Lab Professionals Week, CME 21st April 2019. Today is uh, Easter Day, so I wish you everybody uh, a happy Easter. For today's topic is, particularly for the session, a good workman takes care of his tools and equipment. What is equipment management? What is equipment management? Equipment management is one of the essential elements of the quality management system. Are you ready to know the different tools and equipment in the laboratory? Here they are. What is tool? A tool can be any item that is used to achieve a goal. These tools are mainly used to perform an experiment or to take measurements and to collect the data. What is equipment? Equipment usually denotes a set of tools that are used to achieve a specific objective. Medical laboratory elements relates to the various tools and equipment. 
that are used by professionals and students working in the laboratory. There are many types of tools in the laboratory. There are measuring tools, testing tools, magnifying tools, and safety tools. Here are some of the examples are shown on the slide for measuring tools. Weight, temperature, humidity, time, and volume are the measuring tools. Here, microscope slides, petri dishes, and pipettes are used for testing tools. Microscopes are the magnifying tools. Fire extinguisher, fire filterings are used for the safety of the laboratory as well as for the equipment. There are many kinds of laboratory equipment which are used in the lab. Microscope, centrifuge, microbutact, refrigerator, deep freezer, autoclave, water oven, incubator, diacetic acid, water bath, electronic balance, fertilizer, washer, shaker, spectral photometer, Bunsen burner, calvinators, weighs and bottles, test tube, beaker, funnel, thermometer, fraud extinction, and fraud extinction, fraud items. These equipments are categorized as analytical and non-analytical. Analytical instruments are large class of instruments used for analytical applications in chemical laboratory. Analytical instruments field has become more sophisticated nowadays. Non-analytical instruments are which suppress the analytical instrument to maintain the quality. Here, advanced analytical laboratory equipment. Here, non-analytical and analytical equipments, uh, equipments are combined together and uh, it performs. Here, address under XPT is connected with the RTO automation. So, the samples are sorted out and the samples will be sent to the particular equipment. Like this, we have a RTO thermal and inverter and inlay. Without the equipment, it includes hard wheels and software as instruments, measuring systems, and the LIS. Advanced analytical equipments. Two examples for the advanced analytical equipments are shown here. Here, immunoassay system. Andrea 1800 is carried out, carried out by this system. Here, electrophoresis system. Capillary is electrophoresis carried out in this. And chromatography system. Here, In the SMS lab, we have the zero and decoding system to carry out those chromatography system. Now we will see how to have a second management of laboratory equipment. A good laboratory equipment management program which will, which will achieve maintaining a high level of performance reducing interruptions of services due to breakdowns and failures, improving customer satisfaction, improving the technologist's confidence and knowledge, quality of patient care and satisfaction, patient as well as user safety. Now, coming back to the equipment maintenance program, there are various stages and
there are various stages in the equipment management cycle. The first stage is selection and acquisition. After the selection of the selection and acquisition of the new equipment, it has to be installed. This is the second stage in the equipment maintenance cycle. The third stage is calibration and validation. Once after the calibration of the new equipment, it has to be validated. Next is maintenance, daily, weekly, monthly, as needed, and priority maintenance is carried out in, in this stage. Troubleshooting. If the equipment is breakdown, first we have to check for the troubleshooting. Then the service engineer will service and prepare the new equipment will be have it will have a regular maintenance throughout the lifetime of the equipment. The last stage is condemnation and disposal. If the equipment is very old and we get the frequent breakdown, then the equipment has to be condemned or disposed or scrapped. <coughs> we will see the equipment maintenance cycle in detail now. The equipment selection and acquisition. This is done by the management depending upon the need. For example, for the choice of non-analytical equipment, such as a centrifuge, the choice of refrigerator centrifuge was based upon the following observations. It was noticed that in the ordinary centrifuge, without refrigeration, the gel barrier in the gel tube was not coming to the center of centrifugation. It was floating on the top. This was interfering with aspiration of sample by the analyzer. It was dispersed and root cause analysis was done and found this leakage due to the centrifugation. So the management decided to procure a refrigerated centrifuge. The problem of floating gel barrier was solved with use of a refrigerator centrifuge. Example of analytical equipment for the say HPA1C. The lab was using an analyzer for bus for HPA1C. The number of pictures for was less than 20. After a few years, the number of pictures for HPA1C become close to 50. So the management procured a dedicated analyzer by that for HPA1C. After three more years, further increase in request of the management decided to procure a temporary electrophoresis system for HPA1C. The same equipment was already being used for serum protein electrophoresis. And the management procured one more of the same for HPA1C. The management had already evaluated the vendor and were confident of the service. The electrophoresis could be introduced to the existing alliance, so this was another advantage, so the charge was made. This is the second stage. After the installation, the steps will follow the installation qualification. Once the equipment is acquired, it needs to be taken care of. This starts even before installation. The management comes in routine with HOD technologist and with IT staff to see that the equipment installed has the specifications. The team works with the engineer and provides the infrastructure required, such as power supply, plumbing, supply of waste and wet water, temperature, and humidity. Here, the supply of waste and wet water, we have a milk meter system. The engineer 
we saw the equipment in the lab and surface the insulation qualification. That was rejected by the lab and signed, and it has been filed. Operation qualification. After the insulation is complete, it is checked to see whether all the parts, the hardware and the software are functioning. Example, sample, probe, reagent probe, thermostat, incubator, master computer, uh, keyboard, and touch screen. The report will be submitted and verified by the lab and signed. This also has to be filed. Performance qualification. In performance qualification, we have calibration and validation. This is done again under the supervision of the lab staff. The steps are as follows. Reagents are loaded and tests, tests are calibrated. Then the precision and acquisition are checked as part of verification. Precision for each test is determined using the internal quality control. The standard deviation or coefficient deviation percentage should be within acceptable limits. Accuracy is verified by participating external quality assurance. The Z score should be within an acceptable limit. Performance qualification that is, precision and accuracy is documented and signed by both parties. The following documents have to be obtained. Equipment manual, feasibility certificates, assay SOP from the kit manufacturers, records of performance verification, staff training and competence evaluation certificates. Authorization of staff to operate the equipment. I just want to make clear that, so have you heard of IQ, OQ, and PQ? Okay, for uh, each and every equipment, you should have IQ, OQ, and PQ. So they will, service engineer will give uh, the certificates based on that place, based on that place. If you are shifting it somewhere else, then you have to take it again. Okay, it is not that uh, you are using it here, you are shifting it somewhere, then again you have to do all these things. So that's, it is dependent on the place, and if you move it somewhere else, not from here to there, if you move it somewhere else, then you have to do again the performance qualification, everything. You have to do validation steps. Okay. It has to go through the calibration. So everything, calibration, everything has to be done. So that's why they give IQ, OQ, PQ, based on that location where you have installed the equipment. So you have to inform them before transferring any equipment, okay? Now, process for calibration of analytical and non-analytical equipment. Analytical equipment's calibration is one done once in a year by the manufacturer or the supplier of the equipment as the manufacturer's specifications. How many of you have seen calibration certificates? Yeah. So this analytical equipment, after the calibration, the supplier has to give the certi uh, calibration certificate. Here, for the height uh, axis, this calibration certificate is given. On the certificate, the name of the instrument, model, and serial number will be mentioned. And also the engineer who calibrated his name will be mentioned. Date of calibration and next the due date will be mentioned along with the parameters what he has checked. After, along with the calibration certificate, we also have to get the traceability certificate. This traceability certificate is the one, the standard which they use for that we have to get the traceability. Non-analytical equipment calibration certificate is obtained from external agency 
the hurricanes that are operated by NABM. This is the example of our non-analytical calculations that we get. This is done by the transcript and the standard what they use for that process that we also they have to give along with the date of installation and that due date will be mentioned. The person who calibrated, checked by and authorized it has to be mentioned. Analytical, non-analytical instruments which are likely to have an effect on the accuracy of the test result are subjected to periodic calibration checks. Again, this is for the centrifuge calibration circuit. After the installation of the new equipment, we have to affix the sticker on the new equipment. How many of you have noticed the sticker is affixed on the equipment? Yeah. Yeah. This one? Sticker affixed on the equipment should provide details as per the ISO 15189. Here in the sticker, name of the equipment, date of installation, serial number of the equipment will be mentioned. Along with this, if the machine is under rental agreement in the equipment, the rental agreement in the agreement's detail will be there. Supposing if the equipment is under AMC, annual maintenance contract details should be given, along with uh, permit maintenance detail. Identity of the equipment, manufacturer's name, type, identification, and serial number were applicable. Name of the telephone number and email of the contact person should be mentioned. Current location of the instrument, date of receipt and installation, condition on receipt, whether if it is a new equipment, whether it is new, which has, it has to be mentioned, or if it is refurbished, it has to be mentioned. Manufacturer's instruction or reference to be documented. Equipment installation report indicating its initial acceptability. Equipment performance record confirming its ongoing suitability for use. Equipment maintenance plan should be there. Details of damage if a malfunction is done or if any modification or repair indicating predicted replacement should be there. And these records are maintained within our respective department and are retained for the lifespan of the equipment. Coming back to the next stage in the equipment maintenance cycle. This is the first stage, equipment maintenance. The manufacturer's protocol has to be strictly followed. This usually as time-based maintenance. Daily, weekly, monthly, start of the day and end of the day. On sophisticated analyzers, this is done through keyboard commands and gets recorded. These records not to be checked by compliant to manufacturer's recommendation. Quality maintenance is generally done by the engineer. For the maintenance and for 
commissioning of the major non-analytical equipment, we have a service contract. The service contract will be having type of service, frequency, and cost. For the annual maintenance contract, the internet staff provides. That is, if any breakdown, they will inform, and the service engineer will be you will be attending and it will be serviced. Here the CMC will be for four visits. The cost is fixed and this uh, will be renewed every year. Conference maintenance contract. Here the varying response time available. Here for the minus force it will be charged and for consumer loans it is free. If the equipment is under warranty, quick response available at all times of maintenance and repair. Next stage is troubleshooting and service and repair. When there is a problem with the equipment, the service engineer is called. The problem might be minor one. For example, if the fluid level is jammed, this can be done by the trained technologist under the guidance of the service engineer. If the problem is more complex, the lab should not try to attempt to, and to repair without the advocate knowledge. Service reports. Each time a report is carried out, a service report has to be given by the engineer. If it is a major part being replaced, for example, bulb is changed, the equipment should be recalibrated and, and verified before being used for the patient sample testing. Internal QC should be run to verify satisfactory performance. The time at which breakdown happened, the time at which the service engineer responded, repaired, and finally the time at which patient sample would be tested should be a part of a record. This equipment downtime is very important record. Last stage of equipment maintenance cycle is condemnation and disposal. The equipment is condemned based upon the following record. Mean time between failures. The average time elapsed between failures, repeated failures, the number of failures within a specific period of time. Response time, the time between a request for service and the start of repair. Repair time, the time between the start and finish of repair. Down time, the percentage of time that the device is out of service. Do not use equipment that does not function properly. If any equipment is not working, you have to affix the sticker, to, uh, sticker do not use, and this equipment uh, has to get advised. Equipment management oversight. And then responsibilities to all activities. Train all personnel on requirements and maintenance needs. Monitor equipment management facility. Ensure all procedures are followed. Review all records routinely. Update procedures as needed. <coughs> to conclude the presentation, few points for take home. Okay. An equipment management program will address equipment selection, priority maintenance, procedures for troubleshooting and repair. Documents and records will include inventory of all laboratory equipment, information provided by the manufacturer on operation, maintenance and troubleshooting. Records are for preventive maintenance and repair activities. 
Thank you, Ms. Hoon. Then we have this equipment maintenance program, which provides highly per per performance and great confidence in the reliability of results. There were interruptions in test performance, lower repair cost, and elimination of premature replacement of equipment. Increased safety of laboratory workers will result from well maintained equipment. Thank you. So, she has given an overview of uh, equipment maintenance. Uh, equipment maintenance. So it is better to have a software for this with all alerts. But if you don't have it, if you have a will that you have, you should know each and everything. And if you want to maintain it, it can be maintained through an Excel sheet also. So you should know what to maintain, how to maintain, and you should have, you should uh, know what it is. Okay, you can maintain each and everything, all these things on an Excel sheet and. Uh, uh, you can make a preventive maintenance plan also. So you should know the Excel, that's all. You have to learn Excel sheet, how to, uh, you should know computers, okay? Any other helps? Thank you, Mr. Vishal, for the presentation. Thank you, Vishal. Just a few points I'd like to add here. Uh, one is when you select equipment, make sure you don't over-equip yourself. At the same time, do not under-equip yourself. Both are not a productive uh, equation. Second is uh, make sure that you invest on preventive maintenance. It is better you have an annual maintenance contract signed with the vendor because once you have a contract, you have all the power to question them and ensure that things are done on time. Third is the calibration. Most of us, as I've seen, uh, we get the calibrations done as per prescribed frequencies, and once the calibration report comes to us, we are very happy that calibration report is there, we put it in our file. We have done calibration for NABL purpose. NABL inspector, when they come, let them have a look. What will happen is the inspector would have seen certain essential information in the calibration certificate is missing. In spite of the calibration having done, been done by an accredited laboratory. A simple example I will give you is, if you have calibrated your centrifuge, which you are using at 10,000 RPM, but you have not checked whether your calibration agency has actually calibrated at 10,000, you might have given 1,000, 2,000, and 4,000. So the purpose for which you are using the centrifuge, the speed at which you are using centrifuge, is not calibrated. It's not calibrated at 10,000. So what I suggest and advise each one of you who are dealing with the equipment calibration is you have to prepare your own checklist of what are the points you need to check out in your calibration report. When the calibration certificate comes to you, you have your own worksheet or format, checkpoint 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all of them are satisfied. See if the measurement uncertainty is mentioned or not. All these things are important. Date of next calibration, accreditation status, all that you have to check. And then you say all these points have been checked. Calibration certificate accepted, put it in your plan. But if you do not do this, then you are not doing calibration for purpose of giving an accurate report. You are doing calibration only for accreditation. Sir, sir, all these are very important. Otherwise, it will straight away reflect on the patient report and how will the tag. In the day, we are here to serve the patient care. If we are not doing that only, then what's the point of this? Okay. So the next session, we are having this and controlling, uh, actually building the checkpoints. So probably I think the previous uh, session of Dr. Pratik was controlling pre and antical error. So now the next session for Dr. Pratik is the control is uh, building the checkpoints for the pre and antical error. Pratik, again.
तू बोल
You have to take your kids or your friends along. So home is one point. And then you get to the mosque nowadays, not even the theater. In mosques, first thing what happens? How do you enter? What will be there? So security check is there. And then you reach the movie floor. There again, security check. And then what they expect? Because it's online, no? Yeah, your QR code. So there's one more. And then if you have any eatables, they take it. Definitely. And then you'll actually reach out. So to reach from ticket to theater, you have so many steps. And for you to actually enter that movie, you already have different checkpoints. So we we'll take the journey like that. How we build checkpoints for a sample in our lab. So this is the basic thing. How is the journey of the sample? So it has a pre-examination phase, examination phase, and a post-examination phase. Okay. Who is a cricketer? I'm very fond of cricket. That's why I'm putting examples of what I've seen. So with this, I want you to give information. So let me ask you the question. I need this session to be very interactive. Okay. So can you tell the batting first or batting second? Hmm? Can you tell with this information available? No. Are they playing in Bangalore or Kolkata? Oh. Mr. Pitt? No. Huh? Can you tell? No. So, are you able to tell whether like they have made, is it the first ball Virat Kohli facing or is it after some 40 ball, 50 ball? No. So, literally have no information at all. So, we will come to the first thing. So, where they are playing first. Now, where are they playing? Kolkata. Okay. So we'll just keep this information. Now we'll go back to the sample thing. Okay. So you have your pre-examination. I have divided into many phases. So first phase one, what Oshan spoke about, the registration and the pre-registration. So in the pre-registration, you would make them aware whether the test is available with you or not, whether the sample which has reached, has met the criteria, all those things. Then the registration that happens as per your test score and everything, and then the verification. Now, there was one very interesting description which we saw last week. The clinician has asked for two tests. One is calcium. The second, he has written something like this. What would you read this as? CTP. Okay. Okay. They have put that description itself on this. It's like something like this. Now how would you write? Hmm. So what? That's right. Let's interrupt the verification. No. Even at the verification stage, when there was a person who was sitting, he could somehow sense that probably it is CVP and not CRP what we have registered for. And like, because if it's a CRP, then I would not need a EDTA sample at all. Now, since it's a CPP, I would need a EDTA sample. If it was the other way around, I wouldn't have bothered. So I have two tests which he has asked for, and I have the sample sufficient. So that particular check of verification, even if at all it's of different observers also, that can still help you a lot in reaching this kind of discrepancies, like solving such discrepancies that you know how the doctor's handwriting are. I, I hope more deep than you have seen. So that's a pre-registration, what we spoke of. So the first step where the enter itself is a checkpoint for them. So for them, if I tell, no, you would have come for a passing sample, I would, have, I would prefer you come in the morning, early hour, and you have come in the evening. So that itself is the first checkpoint, right? So your executive or yourself telling them that this 
particular these particular tests need such thing or let's say it's a tissue which has to go for histopathological examination and like if they have sent it in a saline or something not in formal for you it's a step point to alert them that please put formal in now at least this past four hours is okay but at least now you change so that first particular point itself becomes a key for us so then we go by registration where you enter the demographic details of the client and again what we spoke of the transcription code so in your code creation should be so easy that so let's say i am looking for a test for let's say see reactive protein itself once i put reactive it should be able to give me a drag down saying there is an option of c reactive protein so that would make any of them who is resisting the sample so easy that they did not actually think of the code oh it is ccrp crp1 crp2 oh, so many things like that so something where your word based match should happen with your code so that is one more and then so the second block where we in our lab what we have added is the verification which we have been signifying so then once you go to the pre examination that's the phase 1 part where the pa patient or anyone they are dealing only with the sample being there or even with not being there now this happens directly if you are considering blood tests now this where the interaction happen so vacatinal labeling again automated sorter or even like for the order of draw if you can add the number regarding it or given the test that can go in the edpa if you can put lines through it as one of them suggested that's a good thing so the checkpoint can be automated labeling dual identification by the phlebotomist and the client okay and then to be aware of which system to be chosen we have spoken of this so then we have a pre examination stage pre examination that means it has a pre where it has to be tested here so there is phase 3 the transport of the sample and the receipt of the same in the department so how many of you actually like everyone have a log in the phlebotomy and in your central lab like how many samples are being sent they write in a book and say okay three dta has gone to hematology one dta has gone to biochemistry is there a log you follow how do you transport them like from the blood collection area to the examination area how would you tell that okay this sample is transported because later on after 4 hours we'll get a call saying this test is not done at all where is the sample hmm? okay So let's say we you, we have ten samples now that has to reach between hematology and biochemistry. So how would you like for every form you'll be sending across to the department? Yeah. So they would take it. Okay. Not like that. Actually, okay. from hematology, we are sending to the lab. Now we subject them. They will receive the sample, and they will if if it is not there, they will inform us. If we have we have not received, they will tell us we have not received. So this is completely a manual process where you trace it through a form based thing. How many of you actually track samples to a computer based software program? Yes. Computer based software, yes. Okay. Uh, we have follow lab option. Yeah. But uh, sample uh, mm, collected. Where uh, if we have collected DTP as saying whatever we have collected, we will check it and uh, we will stick it. So how many of you actually use computer based tracking for samples? Raise your hands. I'll get you the foot soon. Don't worry. <laughs> so they itself, when they are putting it as now, we have a drop down there also. When we are tracking the sample, it comes as it is 
like it's a EDTA, they have a SP A1 code, so it will say paid with biochemistry. So that's one thing which we have done. So that's what, like for things like ammonia, lactate, they will send a EDTA. So it need not, EDTA need not mean a hematology for every time, right? So and for lactate ammonia, you have to process the sample at the RPS. So even though if you are collecting two EDTA and both of them have reached the hematology at the same time, the person who is sitting at the hematology should be aware that this assay, the extra tube is for another assay which has been there or for us only to consume it. Right? So that's one more tech point where if you can tell that this sample is shared across. So then otherwise if let's say I have considered only for a hemoglobin and I check it and I keep it, I archive it out. So then in biochemistry, they are still searching for where is it, where is it. Oh, probably they have not collected kind of thing, right? So that might still happen. So we, at our lab, we create batches at the actation, at the phlebotomy, and then we send it across. There, every detail comes. And we, in the computer itself, we have that tick option, where once you swipe the barcode, it automatically it gets ticked, and it says sample received. So for that, so sample tracking will also be easy. You need not worry, like, so when the phone call comes, the CBC is not ready, the sample was collected at 9 o'clock in the morning and you are seeing at 5 o'clock in the evening. But then what would have happened, it has gone to HP agency first and it, we haven't tracked it at all. So such things can be minimized. So let's say priority of testing among multiple tests across the department. So that's all. When you have a lactate thing, so two samples, that's okay. Now we have that time we gave a option of a serology, which will happen in next 20 minutes. And then you have the routine chemistry, which can happen throughout the day. So you would always prefer to only pot at least for the sample, which is scheduled first. So things like that. Or let's say HBA1C and malaria itself. So you would release the test of Malaria first rather than HPUC. Now, come back. Can you tell they are batting first or second now? Hmm? How many of you say first? How many of you say second? Huh? Actually, there is no clue. You don't it's, just it's not good. How many runs to win at that? It's little bit. No. So, how many of you said batting first? Okay, we'll stop it there. We'll come back again. Analysis part. Okay, so we still haven't got the complete picture of what Virat Kohli is trying in that particular thing, right? So, examination again, we come to phase one. That's your hand riser. So again, there, the checkpoint itself can be sufficiency, adequacy of the sample. If it's hemolyzed, it's received for a hemo hemoglobin. No, you can definitely reject it. Lipatic sample can be spoke of, if at all, it's not there then, that, that time then. If it's a clot sample, platelet count, you reject it. If there's a clot and they've asked for a blood grouping, would you proceed with the test or not? How many of you say we can proceed? There's a clot in the sample, blood group is asked for. How many of you say we can proceed? How many of you say we won't proceed? Rest of them? <laughs> Just observe the clot. <laughs> There was one thing like uh, how many of you do uh, prothrombin in time in your last year? So what's the principle? What's the method you use? What's the method we actually use universally for prothrombin time? Uh, so what is detect actually? Clot formation. Yeah. So your sister sample is plotted. Should we accept it for PT? Just now you told. Not detection based. Hmm? <laughs> just, just for fun. Okay? So that's what one of my technologists came, he told the PT sample is plotted. 
It will work some message for you. It will plot detected. So if detected the plot, you can go ahead. <laughs> so things like that. So it, it depends. So if it's a cross and it's for a blood grouping, you can still go ahead. Yes. If it's a cross, if it's for hemoglobin anthroposis, you can still go ahead. Okay? If it's hemolyzed, would you go for anthroposis? Would you proceed it for hp c No. If you just want to quantify not the hp c just the other, like just the normal hemoglobin anthroposis, would you go about it or not? Actually, even if you go by the results, what do you think? Because the first the step that happens in hemoglobin anthroposis itself is smaller. So, phase two, it's gone to the analyzer, you have told the sample is sufficient, everything. So now, checkpoint, interface. So let's say you are entering it manually, HB is nine. Above nine, what's the number in your keyboard? What's the number? Huh? In your, you want me to draw your number block? You have seven, eight, nine. That's how it is. <laughs> Zero, four, five, six. Yeah. Okay. What's the number below nine? Six. So in a hurry, if you are typing, that can happen. So once you have an interface, you can give you the result. That is that error can be so that's one checkpoint and then capture photograph this has as I showed you that time we capture for the blood grouping but we capture for everything a UPT positive it would be very critical right a urine pregnancy test coming positive or a negative or even let's say ketone body is positive in a urine sample wide are positive negative serology basically so once you have a proof it's like the technologist who is entering the result is also cross-checking. And the person who is signing out is also looking at, okay, this number, particular sample, viral, is negative, okay, I'm signing it out. Confident. Like, it builds trust, it gives you more confidence for the one who is actually doing the test, who is transcribing it, who is verifying it, cross-checking it, at every point, and mainly for the person who is signing it out. So and then validation of, so that's what I mean. Like, when I've captured something like viral negative, everyone in the thing, because of the capture is there, they agree that it is negative. Or that time we saw the blood group of B positive. Even most of you actually agree that it is B positive, as what machine had interface. So just like that, as simple as that. Now, they're batting. First or second? Second. Second. Mm. So, now we have the complete information almost. Okay. So, there were many checkpoints actually for you to read to tell that the batting second. So, they need so many runs and they are playing in four cutouts against whoever, who is the non striker, who is the all the everything. So you have multiple checkpoints, which we had actually eliminated in our first picture. So that's a, that's a very simple example. Now we'll go again to the last phase, post-examination. So post-examination, you have results. Before we were all kind of handwritten. How many of you still dispatch a handwritten report? Everyone computerized. Sit down. How many of you, how many of your labs actually, like, generates a PDF of that report? One. So most of you, it's like, you enter it in the software and you give the printout of it from a manual thing. So even in that time, if you are transferring from one folder to another folder, the number entry can be wrong. So these things, when you provide something which is user friendly, like once the LIS says all the results are ready and it is signed out, that has to transcribe on its own. If at all, I want to dispatch two results, one patient one and patient two. 
if you are copying it in a word and then putting it across, you might still put it as patient 1 and patient 2 and patient 2 as patient 1. This is a rough system, this is a rough system. Even that can happen there also. Not only a right data screen, right? So that's one. And transcription of results through a feasible interface, that's what I mean. So once you give every responsibility to the LIS itself and it generates a PDF, and once you're giving a bill to your client who is coming, you need even can tell that you can, now everyone has a smartphone. You can say this is the website and if you give this user ID and password, he can download the PDF, he can share it abroad to his relatives who are, who are far, who, a doctor who is sitting so far, everything, right? So that is about the post-examination. So if we go back to this, do you think RCP will win this? I think RCP. Don't consider IPL 2019, this is IPL 2016. Now you tell. Do they win or not? How many of you say RCP will win? Raise, raise, raise your hands. Lunch is almost ready. Right, Prinda? Lunch is ready, no? Ah, so raise your hands. How many of you say RCV is going to win? Yeah, nobody supported Bangalore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, huh? KKR supports us. How many of you say Bangalore is going to lose? The rest of them are not interested in the report? Or? How is it? They can't express Bangalore is going to lose, so they're not going to win. Today is RCV's match. So if we go by that, now, are they going to win or not? <laughs> so, like for me to arrive at this checkpoint where I, I can probably say RCP is going to win. So, there were things where I had to consider where are they playing, how many of runs left, everything. So, once I actually put that slide, we thought, oh, RCP, losing match here, put some photos, you should have put, right? <laughs> so that's where, when you build a lot of checkpoints, the result is actually amazing. So that's what I wanted to tell. Thank you so much. I hope Dr. Pradeep, uh, who has identified a problem, so he has successful in solving the problem also. So any doubt you are having that uh, he has not solved your problem, you can also have an interaction with Dr. Pradeep. You can share across your experiences with how we built these checkpoints in your own lab. We would be glad to hear that. I, I hope he has already solved your problems. Now we can have a break for lunch. So before that, uh, I, I want to just make an announcement that post this session, uh, probably in the end of this session, so we have arranged lab tour for who are want to see the lab, who are want to see the internal process, you can just register with your friend test. So we can have a lab tour also. Thank you. You can break for it. Thank you.